Καλησπέρα σα. Καλώ ήρθατε και πάλι. Επιστρέφουμε πλέον από το διάλειμμα στην κανονική ροή του προγράμματο. Συνεχίζοντα τώρα στο session Network Technologies, θα προχωρήσουμε με την ομιλία τη κυρία Πετροπούλου. Όπω ήδη θα γνωρίζετε, η κυρία Πετροπούλου θα πραγματοποιήσει την ομιλία τη στα αγγλικά. Οπότε και εγώ με τη σειρά μου θα συνεχίσω την παρουσίαση σε αυτά. So, continuing the session Network Technologies, I would like to welcome Mrs. Petropoulou. Mrs. Petropoulou is a distinguished professor at Rogers University, and today she will present us her talk titled as Cooperative Spectrum Sharing Between Radar and Communication Systems. Before we begin, I would like to remind our audience that you can make your questions in English during the talk. However, Mrs. Petropoulou will answer them after she completes her talk. Mrs. Petropoulou, if you are ready, you may begin. Yes. I hear a lot of echo. Okay, that's good now. Γεια σα. Είναι μεγάλη μου χαρά και τιμή να είμαι σήμερα εδώ μαζί σα και θα ήθελα να ευχαριστήσω πολύ για την πρόσκληση. Θα. Αλλά εσεί μπορείτε να μου κάνετε τι ερωτήσει σα στα ελληνικά. So, the talk has to do with spectrum sharing between radar and communication systems. And it's um, a joint work with my past and current students, Boli, Sun Chao San, Dionysis Kalogerias, uh, Zhao Yisu, and Spinoza Ermorphos. The last two are my current students. And this work has been supported by the National Science Foundation and Raytheon uh, Corporation. So, the talk has to do with uh, radar. A uh, special class of radar that I call the multiple input to multiple output radar, MIMO radar, and MIMO communication systems. So I will start with a brief background on MIMO radar, uh, and then I will discuss uh, sharing. First, I will consider sharing between two different platforms, a, a sensing platform and a communication platform that try to access the spectrum, the entire spectrum at the same time and uh, then I will discuss about a different kind of spectrum sharing where we have a radar that transmits waveforms that also convey communication information. So let's start uh, with uh, radar and some motivation. Um, radar are playing a big role in autonomous uh, driving. I mean, this the most uh, anticipated and heavily invested upon technology of our days. So you're looking at the Zoops uh, autonomous driving vehicle um, that is equipped with about 10 uh, radar sensors. So radar play a big role in uh, for autonomous uh, driving. So this is the radar perception configuration for autonomous driving. You have uh, four radar. Um, at the four corners of the car that cover the blue area that you see here, the short range radar, that uh, are basically for uh, uh, cross traffic alert and blind spot detection. Um, they can, the, the range is about 45 meters. There are uh, medium range radar that cover the yellow area that you see here. There are two in the front and two in the back. Uh, the, ra the range is 100 meters and uh, they are for automatic emergency braking. And there is one sensor in the front of the vehicle that covers the red area, uh, has range about 250 meters, and it's for uh, cruise control. And uh, for control critical functions like uh, emergency braking, uh, distant objects need to be detectable with a high angular resolution. And of course, you can improve the angular resolution by using a large uh, radar array, but that would take too much space and could not be easily integrated in the vehicle. So uh, important uh, parameters for uh, autonomous, ve uh, autonomous uh, uh, driving vehicles radar are high resolution, but also small packets size. Another important application of radar is for remote health monitoring. Uh, remote health monitoring enables caregivers to diagnose problems and uh, prescribe treatments from a distance. And we know that in our days, in our COVID days, this is very important when people are isolated at their houses. So um, there are um, 
wearable sensors that have been widely used to track uh, uh, the health of people, like uh, fitness trackers, biometric sensors, uh, smartphones, uh, phones, cameras. Um, however, those uh, must be worn. They can be damaged. Somebody uh, may be required to push a button to alert uh, the doctor. Um, on the other hand, radar technology that has also been used for uh, remote uh, health monitoring applications is a non-intrusive, non-contact monitoring modality. You don't need to wear anything, nothing touches you. Uh, also pres preserves your privacy because a camera may uh, compromise the, pri the privacy of the person is uh, being monitored. So there are uh, ultra wideband radar that operate in 24 gigahertz uh, frequency uh, band uh, that uh, can easily penetrate curtains, clothing. Um, they don't uh, uh, care about lighting conditions or dust, and they can pr provide continuous monitoring. Again, high resolution is very important in order to be able to track multiple uh, individuals. Now let's uh, see what is a, a MIMO radar. <clears throat> uh, widely known in radar is a phased array. A phased array uh, consists of a signal going through an RF chain um, and then the RF chain is connected to a number of antenna elements. Uh, the antenna elements basically implement analog processing of the signal that is coming out of the RF chain by changing the phase. And uh, by changing the phase in these uh, antennas, you can formulate a beam uh, focusing in a particular direction. So by changing, continuously changing those uh, weights of the antennas, you can move the beam like in a spotlight mode and scan for targets. Uh, so there is only one waveform involved. Uh, you can form narrow beams with a phased array, and the uh, phased array uh, enjoys high uh, processing, coherent processing gain. Now, what is a MIMO radar? Unlike a phased array, here you have multiple signals that go through multiple RF chains, and each RF chain is connected to one antenna. So in that sense, the, uh, the MIMO radar transmits independent waveforms. And it's this waveform diversity that allows it to formulate a very wide beam. Actually, you can design the beam to any way you want it. And by having a wide beam, you don't need to scan space. You blast the entire space and you can track multiple targets simultaneously. Another important uh, 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 property of MIMO radar is that you can uh, simulate virtual arrays um, and with a small number of elements, you can achieve very high resolution. Typically, the resolution of an array uh, depends on how many array elements you have and how they are uh, placed. So a MIMO radar can formulate longer arrays than the first array with the same number of antennas. And uh, to give you an idea how this works, uh, suppose that uh, here are the transmit antennas. They suppose that they transmit this uh, phi 1, phi 2 independent waveforms. If these waveforms are orthogonal, as these waveforms uh, go up and they're reflected by the target, they're received by the receive array. If you look at one antenna in the receiver array, it will receive a superposition of the <coughs> waveforms that were transmitted. And because these waveforms were orthogonal, and knowing these waveforms, the antenna can perform match filtering. And uh, match filtering with each of the transmitted waveforms will give them, um, let's say if you have three uh, waveforms, match filtering with three waveforms will give you three views of the target the blue, the red, and the green. So each receive antenna can give you three views of the target. So if you have three receive antennas, here you have nine views of the target. Um, 
So, so, so this is a visual array of nine elements. So although you have three plus three elements, physical elements, six, you're formulating an array has uh, nine uh, virtual elements. So it has higher resolution than the actual array that you have. So this um, uh, allows the MIME moderator, the virtual array allows the MIME moderator to achieve higher resolution with smaller number uh, of, of elements. And uh, it has been, uh, this property has made MIME moderator very popular in autonomous vehicle uh, applications. Uh, for example, um, the radar that I mentioned uh, that are currently used uh, for uh, driving applications do not have very high resolution uh, and mostly uh, rely on LiDAR. LiDAR rely on, on light. Uh, uh, they can achieve very high resolution. They create these uh, point clouds and the point clouds can be processed by machine learning algorithms to localize targets with very high resolution. However, LiDAR uh, are susceptible to weather, fog, rain. On the other hand, my radar have the potential to achieve very high resolution and they have a lower cost than LiDAR and they do not depend on the weather. So this has made my radar very popular in autonomous uh, vehicle applications and uh, there's a lot of activity in, in trying to use them uh, in autonomous driving vehicles. And uh, here I'm giving you a uh, sort of uh, tutorial level article that we have written on the use of MIMO radar for autonomous driving. So let's see how the MIMO radar uh, works. You have uh, transmit antennas and the receive antennas and you sample the uh, signals received by the received antennas and you use these samples to populate a matrix, I saw here as red, that we call the data matrix. And you can uh, uh, have this matrix locally, or you can send this matter, this this data somewhere to be processed, and based on this data, you will detect the targets and so on. Now we have noticed that for a small number of targets and a relatively larger number of antennas, this data matrix is low rank. It has uh, low rank means that it has a lot of redundancy. And you don't really need all its elements in order to uh, uh, do your target uh, estimation. So based on this observation, we proposed the MIMO radar with sparse sensing and matrix completion. We call it MIMO MC. So uh, instead of the uh, instead of the receive antenna sampling at the Nyquist rate. Each receive antenna performs random some sampling in time. So when you do that, each antenna uh, has its own uh, random some sampling scheme. If you uh, use the samples to populate the data matrix, you will get something like this, like a sparse, sparsely populated matrix. But because this matrix is low rank, you can recover the missing elements. And the process to recover the missing elements is called matrix completion. So uh, based on this observation, uh, uh, is a method that I will uh, describe later. Um, so fewer samples, obtaining fewer samples is important because uh, if you want to uh, communicate all this information to the data center to do the processing, you have to send less bandwidth. Also, obtaining less samples means that you need slower A to D converters, uh, which is uh, important savings. Now, this work uh, uh, is part of my the PhD of my student, San Chao San, and I uh, just wanted to mention that for, for his work, this work, he received best PhD dissertation in 2018 uh, from the IEEE Aerospace and Electronic Systems uh, Society. So I mentioned that uh, we can recover the missing elements using matrix completion. So matrix completion is uh, basically you have a matrix and you have missing elements and you need to fill in the missing elements. And you do that um, by uh, finding the smallest 
nuclear norm matrix X that has the observed entries. And of course, uh, this can be done under certain conditions. Uh, the matrix needs to be low rank. Uh, it, its entries, the observed entries, must be sampled uniformly at random, and it must have low coherence. Uh, now, what this means for our problem, because we want to apply matrix computation to our problem, our data matrix needs to have low coherence. And uh, just to give you an idea what low coherence is, you look at, you do singular value decomposition of the matrix and look at the left and right singular spaces. And uh, you look at the coherence parameters of the left and right subspaces. And um, I mean, uh, we, we came up with this theorem that basically says that the coherence of the left and right subspaces are bounded by these quantities. And it's these bounds that matter for a matrix completion. You want these bounds to be as low as possible. One is the smallest possible value and it's the optimal uh, possible value. So our bounds look like this and it's interesting to see that when the number of received elements, MR, increases, then the limit of this bound is one. So asymptotically, it's optimal because the coherence bound is one. Um, same for uh, the other parameter, uh, if the number of transmit antennas increases. Uh, if you look at this quantity here, the denominator, it depends on how closely the targets are. If the targets are very closely, this quantity, capital F, is large, and then the bound increases, which means that if the numbers are very closely spaced, then the coherence bound increases and you have a, a more of a problem in, uh, in matrix completion. So um, it's a nice analysis of uh, when you can do um, uh, matrix completion in, in line more data. Uh, let me uh, now uh, move to um, spectrum sharing between MIMO radar and MIMO communication systems. So uh, radio spectrum is among one of the most tightly regulated resources. So in the US, the spectrum between 9K uh, and 300 gigahertz is regulated. And uh, of course, the regulation uh, has the purpose of preventing interference, but uh, it often leads to unbalanced spectrum utilization. For example, you're looking at here of the uh, a spectrum uh, of uh, signal recorded in uh, downtown Berkeley several years ago um, between zero and six gigahertz. <clears throat> And you can see a lot of activity below two gigahertz and uh, less activity between two uh, and, and six. So between two and four gigahertz is uh, the so-called S-band that uh, is, uh, um, is, is assigned to airborne uh, early warning radars, long range weather radar, but it is also uh, given to um, communication technologies like uh, WLAN networks, uh, 3.5 gigahertz, um, 5G, NR, LTE, uh, and so on. There are uh, ongoing efforts because, uh, I mean, spec spectrum scarcity is an ever growing problem with the introduction of new wireless technologies. So, uh, these wireless technologies need more and more spectrum. So there are ongoing efforts to share spectrum in this band that I indicate here by green uh, between uh, uh, 3500 and 3700 megahertz. This band is uh, currently assigned to uh, high-powered seaborne, airborne, and ground-based radar that are operated by the Department of Defense in the U.S. Of course, when this happens, um, if if you uh, if when they assign this for joint use between uh, 
commercial wireless applications and military radar, there will be interference. Also, there are other applications where we will soon see interference between radar and communication systems. Uh, think of the room monitoring application that I mentioned. Uh, uh, UWB radar operating 24 gigahertz millimeter wave band. But the, the same band has been licensed for 4G deployment in, in most major cities. So soon you will use your cell phone inside a room that uh, um, uses radar technology for monitoring. There will be interference. Uh, another application is next generation radars for autonomous driving. Um, those radars will operate in 76 to 81 gigahertz band. And uh, if you look at current vehicle to uh, infrastructure communications, they operate at uh, 5.9 gigahertz using 30 megahertz bandwidth. But this bandwidth is really low for future vehicles. Like in the future, we are envisioning connected vehicles that will be able to uh, communicate with each other and share sensor measurements. For example, the vehicle that is going in the front will be able to alert the vehicle uh, way back that there is an obstacle so that the vehicle can take uh, <coughs> proactive uh, control actions. But this will require a lot of bandwidth. So um, it is uh, uh, autonomous uh, driving uh, applications are looking into using the W band uh, to share information. Um, so in this case, there will be also interference if you try to use your phone, uh, if, if you try to uh, um, communicate inside the car, there will be interference between radar and communications. Uh, so controlling interference and efficient uh, spectrum sharing is very important. Now, efforts to control interference uh, have uh, been uh, going on. Um, there was a report by NTIA. NTIA is a federal agency that administers spectrum for uh, federal and military applications in the US. So they said that if we're going to release that uh, uh, frequency range between 3.5 and 3.7 gigahertz, then we're going to use exclusion zones, which means that um, uh, for those frequencies, uh, the yellow zones that are shown here will be uh, assigned only to radar applications. But of course, these zones run through large metropolitan areas. So it cannot, uh, uh, I mean, you cannot take advantage of this new spectrum uh, if uh, there are these exclusion zones. So there are uh, other approaches to do dynamic spectrum access by sharing the, the bandwidth, the spectrum, or uh, using uh, time division multiplexing. But of course, those are not spectrally efficient approaches. And um, there are other approaches that rely on the availability of multiple antennas, both at the radar and the communication system, via which you can do spatial multiplexing. And there are various approaches for spatial multiplexing. Um, and most of the previous works uh, uh, optimized one system or the other, but not both. We proposed a joint design of the radar and communication system in order to control interference. So, um, you have a radar and the radar is interested in targets, let's say cars. This radar could be inside the car. But, and you have a cell phone that is trying to communicate with the base station. So when the radar transmits, it interferes with the base station, the received signal at the base station. And when the cell phone is trying to communicate with the base station, it creates interference to the radar. So if the radar and the cell phone are close by, they will interfere and we need to control this interference. And uh, um, I'm going to briefly describe our work on this. So uh, basically you fit the model to this uh, uh, scenario. You have the 
uh, the channel between the communications, the cell phone and the base station H. Uh, you have the interference channel G2 uh, to the radar, and you have the interference channel to the uh, base uh, base station G1. And we propose to use a MIMO MC radar, radar that does far sensing. Uh, and uh, we have we propose the use of a control center that will try to co-design the two systems, the signaling schemes of the two systems, so that we control uh, the interference to the radar subject to meeting um, rate, a certain rate for the communication system co-design. We could have uh, selected a different metric, but this is uh, the metric that we used in our paper. Um, my other, this, this was part of the PhD work of my other student, Boli, who also received Best Dissertation uh, Award by the ITP Aerospace and Electronic Systems Society. And I'm very excited. Our key paper in this um, is it received the 2020 IEEE Signal Processing Society Young Author Best Paper Award that will be given at this uh, coming ICAS. So uh, the joint design, um, we show that the joint design outperforms non-cooperative schemes or partially cooperative methods. Um, the random sum sampling that happens at the MIMO MC radar plays a key role in the joint design because it modulates the interference channel, it increases its null space, and this allows for the communication uh, system to transmit in a way that does not uh, create interference to the radar. We saw that MIMO MC radar can coexist with communication systems and achieve a better target estimation than MIMO radar uh, using up to 60% in data samples. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, show you I know that students are not afraid of math. So I just wanted to show you the uh, mathematical formulation. I'm not going to go into details. So you look at the received signal at the radar and communication receiver. Um, this is why YR is the data matrix. And because of the random sum sampling that you do, you have an omega matrix that consists of ones and zeros, one corresponding to the sample uh, uh, components. And here you have the signal that the radar is interested in. D contains information about the targets. P is the precoding matrix that you will need to optimize. S are the radar waveforms. Then you have clutter. Clutter is echoes from targets of no interest. Um, so C basically uh, uh, describes the structure of, uh, of clutter. Uh, and PS is the tr transmitted uh, waveform because it's reflections from, from clutters, this component. And then you have this term that uh, contains the communication waveforms X uh, plus noise. And similarly, at the communication receiver, you have the signal X that is of interest. And then you have the interference from the radar and noise. And um, now we want to, I said, we want to optimize the signal to interference ratio at the communication receiver, um, at the radar plus, uh, subject to meeting the communication rate. Uh, so let's, this is the covariance matrix of the interference at the uh, communication receiver. You see P here is, uh, uh, sorry, phi is P P Hermitian has to do with the signaling scheme of the radar. G1 is the interference channel. And if you look at the radar, um, the interference channel is time varying. These are the communication uh, antennas, transmit antennas, and these are the radar receive antennas. So on a sample by sample basis, the sampling configuration changes to the radar. So uh, this is uh, the first sample of the second sample uh, and so on. So this means that the channel is effectively modulated by this random sum sampling and it's time varying. So we can talk about interference as the average 
interference of uh, um, L symbols, which depends on the signaling, signaling scheme of the communication system, R uh, sub X. And if we want to uh, formulate the SNR, we talk about the effective SNR because we only care about the sample uh, point, the sampled instances. Then uh, we can formulate a problem uh, as follows. We want to maximize the, expect the effective SINR that depends on uh, Rx, the signaling scheme of the communication system, omega, the sampling scheme of the radar, and phi, uh, uh, the precoding scheme of, of, of the radar. Uh, so we want to maximize this subject to meeting an average rate for the communication system. Uh, we also want to meet uh, maybe power constraints of the communication system and the radar system. And of course, this is a difficult problem to solve. We assume that this will be solved at the uh, uh, central station uh, that will collect information about the channels and will solve this problem and will pass to the radar and to the communication system the signaling schemes that they need to use. This is a difficult problem to solve, but we propose to solve it using alternating optimization, where you solve, you fix two of the parameters and you solve for the other one in a loop. And we have uh, some feasibility uh, of this, uh, of the solution and so on. Uh, again, this, uh, the success of this scheme lies in the modulation of the interference channel that happens because of the random uh, sum sampling. So if you did not do random sum sampling, that would be plain uh, MIMO radar. Then you have the G2, the G2 channel um, in, in, uh, in reality, in a practical scenario, this would be a full rank matrix, this channel matrix. It has an uh, empty null space, so the communication system cannot uh, design its uh, signaling scheme to avoid interference to uh, the radar. Uh, however, um, because of the random sum sampling, um, the null space is not empty now, and uh, this gives the opportunity to the communication system to um, uh, choose its signal scheme to avoid interference. And I guess I will skip the, uh, the results because I don't have enough time. I'd like to discuss a little bit about dual function radar communication systems. In this case, you use uh, one waveform, both for sensing and communication purposes. This is key technology for uh, uh, autonomous driving applications because as, as already said, you want uh, in a future scenario, you will have vehicles that uh, um, have radar that uh, sense the environment. And uh, it would be great if these signals could also uh, convey information to neighboring cars, passing uh, the information that they collect through their sensors so that its car has the uh, augmented perception of uh, the surrounding. Uh, we have a, a, a review paper on uh, dual function radar communication systems that appeared last year and can give you a good uh, um, exposure to the field. This is a very hot area. Some people think that uh, dual function systems will be the basis uh, of 6G systems. It's going to be uh, the basic uh, physical layer in 6G systems. Uh, so, how do you design the radar waveforms to um, uh, have this ability to convey information? I mean, there are, uh, of course, uh, it's not a, a straightforward problem. You can, uh, let's say, if you have multiple antennas, you can design a beam and devote the main beam to the radar and the side lobes. You can um, embed communication information or by uh, activating the antennas uh, in a certain pattern, like a Morse code, you can convey information based on the activation pattern. Um, we have proposed to use uh, OFDM signals for uh, uh, transmitting both for doing sensing and also communicating. 
And uh, uh, previously, I mean, this is a news to our previously of them systems have been proposed for uh, such uh, uh, DFRC systems, but the communication rate was very low because in order to maintain uh, orthogonality and use the virtual array feature of, of MIMO radar, they were assigning carriers to antennas in an exclusive fashion. Uh, when you don't do that, uh, then the target parameters get coupled and it's not straightforward how you do it. But uh, we published a paper and we are getting ready to uh, submit a journal on this where we show that you can actually do that. You can let the antennas use the carriers in a shared fashion and still be able to uh, uh, obtain target information. So in that uh, way, you achieve very high uh, communication rates. I know that um, uh, my time is not I'm over time. Uh, I just wanted to uh, tell you uh, a couple more uh, potential applications for this. So millimeter waves and massive MIMO uh, are ideal if you want to achieve high throughput communication and high accuracy because there is a huge bandwidth in millimeter wave signals which is great for uh, range resolution, for target localization, and it's great for conveying communication information. But uh, uh, millimeter waves die out very fast. So you need large antenna arrays in order to be able to uh, create uh, pencil-like beams um, to uh, compensate for the path loss. And this can be achieved with uh, a massive MIMO technology. Uh, however, fully digital massive MIMO is very expensive uh, because you need a lot of RF chains that uh, uh, spend a lot of power and involve uh, high cost. Um, and uh, we have done research on choosing how many RF chains you can afford, like a small number of RF chains, um, in order to still be able to form the beam that you want. Um, and we do that using a uh, machine learning technique that we developed with my collaborator Diamantaras from the International Hellenic University in, in Greece. Uh, so let me conclude. Uh, we have pre presented uh, methods for coexistence between uh, uh, MIMO radar that use far sensing and MIMO communication systems and um, we have shown that the co-design can increase spectrum efficiency. We have discussed the dual function radar communication systems and in particular DFRC systems that use sparse sensing. Uh, I briefly discussed uh, DFRC systems that use uh, OFDM waveforms. Um, so as, as I already said, DFMC systems are attracting a lot of attention, but there are many open problems to be addressed. How do you design those waveforms? Because radar waveforms have different uh, purposes than communication waveforms, so you have to somehow reconcile the two. Signal processing holds the key in this uh, code design. So um, this is a, a, a great area if you want to do research in this. So this morning I opened my Facebook and my Facebook reminded me, uh, sent me this, this thing from three years ago where we went to the award ceremony for my student Bolly. As I said, uh, he got the, the um, best thesis award from uh, the uh, Air Space and Electronic Society. And uh, here is Bolly. And here is Sanchea San who got the same award uh, two years ago before Bolly. So very proud of, of my students. Uh, thank you very much. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Mrs. Tatepulu, for your very interesting talk. I think we can begin with the audience questions now. Here comes first. Um, well, uh, could the bandwidth of frequencies be harmful to human bodies? Yes, so, uh, this question. So um, it, maybe the high frequency 
if it's not good for the human body. But uh, I mean, there are studies that uh, uh, I guess they're still going on, but have not uh, shown that there is a problem. Plus, those high frequencies decay very fast. So unless you are uh, exactly on the sensor or on the phone that uses these high frequencies, um, you may not be affected that much. It's all about uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, another question is, what do you feel is the next step forward after MIMO readers? Okay, as I said, uh, we are gearing towards uh, 6G right now. Right now, uh, as uh, 5G is getting off the ground, we have started talking about 6G. And uh, for 6G, um, we need to achieve uh, terabits per second. Uh, we, we want to consider um, uh, terahertz frequencies and achieve terabits per second uh, rates uh, for various applications. So we need really a, a large arrays. These frequencies die out very fast, so we need the large arrays in order to um, be able to uh, create the beams that we want and uh, we need to find how to formulate those those arrays um, keeping small styles and also achieving the sensing performance uh, that we want very nice um, another question is Connecting everyone and everything means our networks will eventually have to cover even the rural parts of countries. Will these technologies help with that? I didn't hear They need to cover what? Okay, I repeat. Connecting everyone and everything means our networks will eventually have to cover even the rural parts of countries. Will these technologies help with that? Um, it is, I mean, uh, yes, we, we want to emphasize on infrastructureless technologies and, uh, and going forward, I guess, uh, how you compute all this, uh, uh, how, do, how do you do the computations in all these methods uh, is becoming very important. Like uh, in most cases, you will need to do the computation close by because um, as I said, for future applications, you need, uh, you care a lot about latency. So it may not be sufficient to send the data to a faraway data center to do the computations. You need to have it close by in an edge uh, infrastructure, as we are saying. So we are, uh, I mean, uh, it's important to uh, have this distributed infrastructure that can be placed everywhere in order to do these computations. So this infrastructure can cover rural areas also. Thank you. And our last question, I hope you're not tired yet. Uh, how can we overcome possible problems of communication between the devices? Because these problems could lead to an accident. Uh, if I understand the question correctly, uh, interference can uh, deteriorate the performance of, let's say, the radar and, and cause an accident. Yes, of course, um, this is a big issue. That's why we have to control interference and we have to have uh, safeguards and maybe one technology by itself cannot do that. So we need uh, multiple technologies. Uh, in order to avoid accidents. Uh, we also need uh, to take into account a, a, a lot of other issues to avoid accidents, like prioritize how to avoid uh, accidents. Um, there is this, um, they say that uh, what happens, a question that we don't have answer to, you have a car and there is, uh, an elderly um, on one side, and there is a woman with a child on the other side, and uh, the car has lost control, and the uh, software takes over. The autonomous driving uh, vehicle software takes over. W which way should it steer the, <laughs> the wheel? I mean, who are you going to spare? 
a lot of questions that uh, have not been answered and do not have an easy answer um, when it comes to autonomous driving. Very well. Um, thank you very much. I think that we have reached the end of our session now. Uh, thank you very much again, Mrs. Petrpoulou, for your talk. We wish you the very best. Now, in this point, I will continue the presentation in Greek. Οπότε επιστρέφουμε τα στόρα στα ελληνικά. Ε, να σας ευχαριστήσω όλους ε, για την παρακολούθηση. Θα περάσουμε σε ένα πολύ σύντομο διάλειμμα και θα συνεχίσουμε με την παρουσίαση των papers. Ευχαριστώ.